Part One, Chapter Six of An Outcast of the Islands by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Six. Lend me your gun, Almayer," said Willems across the table on which a smoky lamp shone redly above the disorder of a finished meal. I have a mind to go and look for a deer when the moon rises tonight. Almayer, sitting sideways to the table, his elbow pushed amongst the dirty dishes, his chin on his breast and his legs stretched stiffly out, kept his eyes steadily on the toes of his grass slippers and laughed abruptly. "'You might say yes or no instead of making that unpleasant noise,' remarked Willems, with calm irritation. "'If I believed one word of what you said, I would,' answered Almayer, without changing his attitude and speaking slowly, with pauses, as if dropping his words on the floor. "'As it is, what's the use? You know where the gun is. You may take it or leave it. Gun. Deer. Bosh. Hunt deer. Ha! It's a gazelle you are after, my honoured guest.' you want gold anklets and silk sarongs for that game my mighty hunter and you won't get those for the asking i promise you all day amongst the natives a fine help you are to me you shouldn't drink so much almayer said willems disguising his fury under an affected drawl you have no head never had as far as i can remember in the old days of makesha you drink too much i drink my own retorted almayer lifting his head quickly and darting an angry glance at Willems. These two specimens of the superior race glared at each other savagely for a minute, then turned away their heads at the same moment, as if by previous arrangement, and both got up. Almayer kicked off his slippers and scrambled into his hammock, which hung between two wooden columns of the veranda, so as to catch every rare breeze of the dry season, and Willems, after standing irresolutely by the table for a short time, walked without a word down the steps of the house and over the courtyard towards the little wooden jetty where several small canoes and a couple of big white whale-boats were made fast, tugging at the short painters and bumping together in the swift current of the river. He jumped into the smallest canoe, balancing himself clumsily, slipped the rattan painter, and gave an unnecessary and violent shove which nearly sent him headlong overboard. By the time he regained his balance, the canoe had drifted some fifty yards down the river. He knelt in the bottom of his little craft and fought the current with long sweeps of the paddle. Almayer sat up in his hammock, grasping its feet, and peering over the river with parted lips till he made out the shadowy form of man and canoe as they struggled past the jetty again. "'I thought you would go,' he shouted. "'Won't you take the gun, Hey, hey!" he yelled, straining his voice. Then he fell back in his hammock, and laughed to himself feebly till he fell asleep. On the river Willems, his eyes fixed intently ahead, swept his paddle right and left, unheeding the words that reached him faintly. It was now three months since Lingard had landed Willems in Sambir, and had departed hurriedly, leaving him in Almayer's care. The two white men did not get on well together. Almayer, remembering the time when they both served Hudik, and when the superior Willems treated him with offensive condescension, felt a great dislike towards his guest. He was also jealous of Lingard's favour. Almayer had married a Malay girl whom the old seaman had adopted in one of his accesses of unreasoning benevolence, and as the marriage was not a happy one from a domestic point of view, he looked to Lingard's fortune for compensation in his matrimonial unhappiness. The appearance of that man, who seemed to have a claim of some sort upon Lingard, filled him with considerable uneasiness, the more so because the old seaman did not choose to acquaint the husband of his adopted daughter with Willem's history, or to confide with him his intentions as to that individual's future fate. Suspicious from the first, Almayer discouraged Willem's attempts to help him in his trading, and then when Willem's drew back, he made, with characteristic perverseness, a grievance of his unconcern. From cold civility in their relations the two men drifted into silent hostility, then into outspoken enmity, and both wished ardently for Lingard's return and the end of a situation that grew more intolerable from day to day. The time dragged slowly. Willems watched the succeeding sunrises, wondering dismally whether before the evening some change would occur in the deadly dullness of his life. He missed the commercial activity of that existence which seemed to him far off, 
irreparably lost, buried out of sight under the ruins of his past success, now gone from him beyond the possibility of redemption. He mooned disconsolately about Almayer's courtyard, watching from afar with uninterested eyes the up-country canoes discharging gutta or rattans and loading rice or European goods on the little wharf of Lingard and Company. Big as was the extent of ground owned by Almayer, Willems yet felt that there was not enough room for him inside those neat fences. The man who, during long years, became accustomed to think of himself as indispensable to others, felt a bitter and savage rage at the cruel consciousness of his superfluity, of his uselessness, at the cold hostility visible in every look of the only white man in this barbarous corner of the world. He gnashed his teeth when he thought of the wasted days, of the life thrown away in the unwilling company of that peevish and suspicious fool. He heard the reproach of his idleness in the murmurs of the river, in the unceasing whisper of the great forest. Round him everything stirred, moved, swept by in a rush, the earth under his feet and the heavens above his head. The very savages around him strove, struggled, fought, and worked, if only to prolong a miserable existence. But they lived, they lived, and it was only himself that seemed to be left outside the scheme of creation, in a hopeless immobility filled with tormenting anger and with ever-stinging regret. He took to wandering about the settlement. The afterwards flourishing Sambir was born in a swamp and passed its youth in malodorous mud. The houses crowded the bank, and, as if to get away from the unhealthy shore, stepped boldly into the river, shooting over it in a close row of bamboo platforms elevated on high piles amongst which the current below spoke in a soft and unceasing plaint of murmuring eddies. There was only one path in the whole town, and it ran at the back of the houses along the succession of black and circular patches that marked the place of the household fires. On the other side the virgin forest bordered the path coming close to it, as if to provoke impudently any passer-by to the solution of the gloomy problem of its depths. Nobody would accept the deceptive challenge. There were only a few feeble attempts at a clearing here and there, but the ground was low and the river, retiring after its yearly floods, left on each a gradually diminishing mud-hole where the imported buffaloes of the Bugis settlers wallowed happily during the heat of the day. When Willems walked on the path, the indolent men stretched on the shady side of their houses looked at him with calm curiosity. The women, busy round the cooking-fires, would send after him wandering and timid glances while the children would only look once, and then run away yelling with fright at the horrible appearance of the man with a red and white face. These manifestations of childish disgust and fear stung Willems with a sense of absurd humiliation. He sought in his walks the comparative solitude of the rudimentary clearings, but the very buffaloes snorted with alarm at his sight, scrambled lumberingly out of the cool mud and stared wildly in a compact herd at him as he tried to slink unperceived along the edge of the forest. One day, at some unguarded and sudden movement of his, the whole herd stampeded down the path, scattered the fires, sent the women flying with shrill cries, and left behind a track of smashed pots, trampled rice, overturned children, and a crowd of angry men brandishing sticks in a loud voice pursuit. The innocent cause of that disturbance ran shamefacedly the gauntlet of black looks and unfriendly remarks, and hastily sought refuge in Almayer's campong. After that he left the settlement alone. Later, when the enforced confinement grew irksome, Willems took one of Almayer's many canoes and crossed the main branch of the Pante in search of some solitary spot where he could hide his discouragement and his weariness. He skirted in his little craft the wall of tangled verdure, keeping in the dead water close to the bank where the spreading nipa palms nodded their broad leaves over his head as if in contemptuous pity of the wandering outcast. Here and there he could see the beginnings of chopped-out pathways, and, with the fixed idea of getting out of sight of the busy river, he would land and follow the narrow and winding path, only to find that it led nowhere ending abruptly in the discouragement of thorny thickets. He would go back slowly, with the bitter sense of unreasonable disappointment and sadness, oppressed by the hot smell of earth, dampness, and decay in that forest which seemed to push him mercilessly back into the glittering sunshine of the river. 
and he would recommence paddling with tired arms to seek another opening, to find another deception. As he paddled up to the point where the Rajah's stockade came down to the river, the Nipas were left behind rattling their leaves over the brown water, and the big trees would appear on the bank, tall, strong, indifferent, in the immense solidity of their life which endures for ages, to that short and fleeting life in the heart of the man who crept painfully amongst their shadows in search of a refuge from the unceasing reproach of his thoughts. Amongst their smooth trunks a clear brook meandered for a time in twining lacets before it made up its mind to take a leap into the hurrying river over the edge of the steep bank. There was also a pathway there, and it seemed frequented. Willems landed, and following the capricious promise of the track, soon found himself in a comparatively clear space, where the confused tracery of sunlight fell through the branches and the foliage overhead, and lay on the stream that shone in an easy curve like a bright sword-blade dropped amongst the long and feathery grass. Further on the path continued, narrowed again in the thick undergrowth. At the end of the first turning Willems saw a flash of white and color, a gleam of gold like a sun-ray lost in shadow, and a vision of blackness darker than the deepest shade of the forest. He stopped, surprised, and fancied he heard light footsteps, growing lighter, ceasing. He looked around. The grass on the bank of the stream trembled, and a tremulous path of its shivering silver-gray tops ran from the water to the beginning of the thicket. And yet there was not a breath of wind. Somebody kind passed there. He looked pensive while the tremor died out in a quick tremble under his eyes, and the grass stood high, unstirring, with drooping heads in the warm and motionless air. He hurried on, driven by a suddenly awakened curiosity, and entered the narrow way between the bushes. At the next turn of the path he caught again the glimpse of colored stuff and of a woman's black hair before him. He hastened this pace and came in full view of the object of his pursuit. The woman, who was carrying two bamboo vessels full of water, heard his footsteps, stopped, and putting the bamboos down, half turned to look back. Willems also stood still for a minute, then walked steadily on with a firm tread, while the woman moved aside to let him pass. He kept his eyes fixed straight before him, yet almost unconsciously he took in every detail of the tall and graceful figure. As he approached her, the woman tossed her head slightly back, and with a free gesture of her strong round arm caught up the mass of loose black hair and brought it over her shoulder and across the lower part of her face. The next moment he was passing her close, walking rigidly, like a man in a trance. He heard her rapid breathing, and he felt the touch of a look darted at him from half-open eyes. It touched his brain and his heart together. It seemed to him to be something loud and stirring, like a shout, silent and penetrating, like an inspiration. The momentum of his motion carried him past her, but an invisible force made up of surprise and curiosity and desire spun him round as soon as he had passed. She had taken up her burden already with the intention of pursuing her path. His sudden movement arrested her at the first step, and again she stood straight, slim, expectant, with the readiness to dart away suggested in the light immobility of her pose. High above the branches of the trees met in a transparent shimmer of waving green mist through which the rain of yellow rays descended upon her head, streamed in glints down her black tresses, shone with a changing glow of liquid metal on her face, and lost itself in vanishing sparks in the somber depths of her eyes that, wide open now with enlarged pupils, looked steadily at the man in her path. And Willems stared at her charmed with a charm that carries with it a sense of irreparable loss, tingling with that feeling which begins like a caress and ends in a blow, in that sudden hurt of a new emotion making its way into a human heart, with the brusque stirring of sleeping sensations awakening suddenly to the rush of new hopes, new fears, new desires, and to the flight of one's old self. She moved a step forward and again halted. A breath of wind that came through the trees but in Willem's fancy seemed to be driven by her moving figure, rippled in a hot wave round his body, and scorched his face in a burning touch. He drew it in with a long breath, the last long breath of a soldier before the rush of battle, of a lover before he takes in his arms the adored woman, the breath that gives courage to confront the menace of death or the storm of passion. Who was she? Where did she come from? 
Wonderingly he took his eyes off her face to look round at the serried trees of the forest that stood big and still and straight, as if watching him and her breathlessly. He had been baffled, repelled, almost frightened by the intensity of that tropical life which wants the sunshine but works in gloom, which seems to be all grace of color and form, all brilliance, all smiles, but is only the blossoming of the dead, whose mystery holds the promise of joy and beauty, yet contains nothing but poison and decay. He had been frightened by the vague perception of danger before, but now, as he looked at that life again, his eyes seemed able to pierce the fantastic veil of creepers and leaves, to look past the solid trunks, to see through the forbidding gloom, and the mystery was disclosed, enchanting, subduing, beautiful. He looked at the woman. Through the checkered light between them she appeared to him with the impalpable distinctness of a dream, the very spirit of that land of mysterious forest standing before him like an apparition behind a transparent veil, a veil woven of sunbeams and shadows. She had approached him still nearer, he felt a strange impatience within him at her advance. Confused thoughts rushed through his head, disordered, shapeless, stunning. Then he heard his own voice asking, "'Who are you?' "'I am the daughter of the blind Omar,' she answered in a low but steady tone. "'And you,' she went on a little louder, "'you are the white trader, the great man of this place.' "'Yes,' said Willems, holding her eyes with his, in a sense of extreme effort. "'Yes, I am white.' Then he added, feeling as if he spoke about some other man, but I am the outcast of my people. She listened to him gravely. Through the mesh of scattered hair her face looked like the face of a golden statue with living eyes. The heavy eyelids dropped slightly, and from between the long eyelashes she sent out a sidelong look, hard, keen, and narrow, like the gleam of sharp steel. Her lips were firm and composed in a graceful curve, but the distended nostrils, the upward poise of the half-averted head, gave to her whole person the expression of a wild and resentful defiance. A shadow passed over Willem's face. He put his hand over his lips as if to keep back the words that wanted to come out in a surge of impulsive necessity, the outcome of dominant thought that rushes from the heart to the brain and must be spoken in the face of doubt, of danger, of fear, of destruction itself. You are beautiful he whispered. She looked at him again with a glance that, running in one quick flash of her eyes over his sunburnt features, his broad shoulders, his straight, tall, motionless figure, rested at last on the ground at his feet. Then she smiled. In the somber beauty of her face that smile was like the first ray of light on a stormy daybreak that darts evanescent and pale through the gloomy clouds, the forerunner of sunrise and of thunder. End of chapter 6. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks.com.